1988 wasn't just any year, it was a year that allowed creativity and hip-hop to run free. Small independent labels encouraged new artists to experiment in their music, and little did they know that this would bring a rise of new talent ready to take hip-hop to the next level. One of those artists was Long Island's very own Biz Marquis, whose hip hop story began in high school as he would often use his unique talent as a human beatbox, whilst his fellow schoolmate Rakim would freestyle from the beats Biz Marquis made. Biz started gaining recognition in New York after appearances at the renowned Latin Quarter nightclub and would later go on to join the Juice Crew alongside other acts such as Core G Rap and Big Daddy Kane. But it was in 1988 where Biz Marquis would gain national attention as he released his debut album Going Off in February of that year. An album that was produced by the legendary Marley Marl from the Juice Crew. Going Off showcases Biz Marquis' funny and goofy rhymes and also his larger than life character. But it was the first track on the B-side that showed the growing rap community how much of a special talent Biz Marquis was. That same year, Biz Marquis would also make a music video appearance alongside the Harlem duo Rob Bass and DJ Easy Rock, who had grown up together and would go on to produce one of the best hip hop tracks of all time, It Takes Two. Rob Bass and DJ Easy Rock were seen as pioneers of the crossover success that rap music would have in the mainstream media, as their track reached number three on the US dance chart. However, that necessarily wasn't a good thing at that time, as artists who crossed over at the time were seen as sellouts by other artists and most importantly, the streets. The duo would then go on to drop their debut studio album, It Takes Two, a project that was certified platinum and also spawned a number one dance record, Get On The Dance Floor. Another duo that would go on to become groundbreaking for hip hop as a genre in 1988 was DJ Jazzy Jeff and the Fresh Prince. Jazzy Jeff had recently won the annual DJ competition for World Supremacy in 1986, and the Philly natives would start making some small waves by dropping their 1987 debut album, Rock the House, an album that was recorded in London. However, it would be a few months later in 1988 when their lives would change forever as they dropped hip hop's first ever double album, He's the DJ, I'm the rapper. As easy as it is to just dismiss this album as corny and commercial, it did break ground as it spawned hip hop's first ever Grammy win with a hit single, Parents Just Don't Understand. There's no need to argue, parents just don't understand. Although Will Smith boycotted the Grammys due to the award not being shown on TV, some of the rap community and the streets never gave the duo their much deserved respect and would often be labelled as sellouts due to their successful crossover to the mainstream. The late 80s was a golden age for sampling, in an era where talented DJs and producers could creatively introduce a generation to a previous generation of unheard classics, and arguably none could do it better at that time than the New York native Marley Marl who has been credited with forever changing the sound of hip hop with his unique beat mixes and his inventive use of the Roland drum machine. Marley Marl alongside DJ Mr. Magic would create the Juice Crew in 1983 and became the in-house producer on the Cold Chilling record label. But it was in September of 1988 
when hip hop would get arguably one of the first rap compilation albums as Marley Ma released his debut album, In Control, Volume 1. The project included some of Marley Ma's Juice Crew artists and also other artists that he was affiliated with. It also showcased his style of hip hop production and sampling at a time when he became one of the first super producers in hip hop music, going on to inspire other super producers such as P. Diddy, DJ Drama and DJ Khaled. Earlier on in 1984, Marley Marwa produced Roxanne's Revenge, the debut single of then up and coming rapper Roxanne Chante, who was still only 14 years old. Roxanne's Revenge is regarded as one of the best diss tracks ever and also a song that led to other new female rappers responding with their own diss tracks, such as the song Sparky's Turn, a response by Brooklyn native Sparky D, who became a pivotal player in hip-hop's golden age. She would release her debut album, This Is Sparky D's World, in 1988. Although she was one of few female MCs in the game at that time, she still showed her potential on songs such as Throwdown and I Can't Stop, with some critics saying that her flow and her delivery would go on to inspire artists such as Missy Elliott. Her lady's first attitude throughout the album definitely shows that she helped lay the foundation for the modern female rapper. But perhaps the leading female MC of the Golden Age from the East Flatbush section of Brooklyn was MC Light, widely regarded as one of the pioneers of female rap. MC Light was an assertive battle rapper with a distinctive voice and no-nonsense demeanor, and in 1987 would release a song she had written when she was only 12 years old, I Cram To Understand You. That debut single would be one of the first songs written about the crack epidemic that was taking place in America at that time. Then in April 1988, she would drop her debut album, Light As A Rock, one of the best and most important rap albums of not only the 1980s but in hip hop history and a project that solidified MC Light as the young leader of a new generation that included the likes of Moni Love and Queen Latifah. Light as a Rock helped to show her assured presence on the mic, especially on the song Paper Thin and also her braggadocious aura on the song 10% Diss leading to several magazines labeling MC Light as the best female vocalist in hip hop. When you say you love me, it doesn't matter. It goes into my head as just chit chatter. You may think it's egotistical or just very free, but what you say, I take none of it seriously. And Elsewhere in New York rap, EPMD, the duo from Long Island, would drop one of hip hop's great debuts with 1988's Strictly Business, the first of several projects that would make EPMD one of the cornerstones of the East Coast rap scene. Strictly Business would go on to be influential as EPMD based its music mainly on lifting funk and rock breaks from samples and helped to popularise their usage on the album alongside their light-hearted party raps. Source magazine would give Strictly Business a 5 mic rating making it one of 43 albums ever to have received this type of rating. However, the group that can boast one of the best pieces of work in 1988 was a collective known as Ultramagnetic MCs, consisting of Said G, Cool Keith, TR Love and Mo Love, all based in the Boogie Down Bronx. Their 1988 classic, Critical Beatdown, lasted the test of time and has been acclaimed by critics as a classic album of hip-hop's golden age, a new school aesthetic. The beats from the album were incredible and a little unique from what was happening in the late 80s and out of all the MCs, Cool Keith was unsurprisingly the star of the show. Clever with both his punchlines and his rhymes, he led the group through the tracks in an engaging way considering it was one of his first entries into hip-hop. A bona fide classic is what Critical Beatdown was labelled by the Rolling Stone magazine. 1988 proved to be a year where a new generation of artists could let their creativity run free and were able to express themselves freely both on the turntables and on the mic. As we all know, the reign at the top of hip-hop can only last so long 
and rap was growing up and growing out from the mid 80s which left a huge void for the title as the best rapper alive in 1988. Stay tuned for the next video where we look at the artists contending for that number one spot as the premier artist in the rap game.